Tonight we return to 1 Corinthians 13, looking this evening at verse 7. This, of course, is the great chapter on love. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let's ask God's blessing. Father, we come this evening and we come to your word with great anticipation. We know your word is truth. It is life. And now open your word to our minds and hearts and open our minds and hearts to your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to admit that if I'm given a choice, I often tend to prefer British comedy over the American efforts. The British, in my opinion, seem more intelligent and truly witty, though their comedy tends to predictably devolve into bathroom humor over time. Recently, we were watching a BBC comedy show and the two main characters in the show began by discussing how hopeless they felt about the world. At first, one of the characters tried to maintain that, no, it wasn't all that bad, but soon his despondent friend had convinced him to join in the despair. So there they both sat with heads in hands, bemoaning the meaninglessness of life. But then the lights came up. They both perked up and pretended to be happy and hopeful. They were full of vim and vigor. And this somewhat humorous sketch was actually quite true to life for many people. They look around and they see the world in its worst possible light and they despair. They want to give in. They are tempted to give up. Life seems meaningless, they think. But then to keep up appearances, they smile and they laugh and they joke and they act as if life is really quite good, thank you. But it's all fake. It's a phony optimism. It's a pretended positivity. Deep down, they believe that all is lost and their hearts are sunk in gloom. Such should never be the case for the Christian. For those who have experienced the love of God in Christ, there is a mu much brighter outlook on this life and the life to come. As we look at our final verse describing and defining love we want to see tonight first four particular facets of love. Then we're going to look at the force of love and finish with some thoughts on practicing bulldog tenacity. As Paul brings this section to a close, he again uses a pithy literary style he is employing four verbs punctuated by the Greek word panta. The word panta means all things, and it can even have an adverbial force. One of the commentators translates it always. The four verbs bring out the four particular facets of love four aspects of this greatest of all qualities. So I want to look at these facets one at a time before we consider the force of the four taken as a unit. The first verb of the four is the hardest of the four. It can mean bears or holds up under. Love bears all things, holds up 
under all things. It always endures, no matter what comes against it. But this verb can also mean to cover over. In fact, the original of the Greek verb has to do with a roof, putting a roof over something to cover over it. The scholars, for their part, seem divided on which meaning the sense seems to prefer. And the context really doesn't lessen the uncertainty. One line of thought says that Paul makes his point about endurance in the fourth and final verb, so this first one should be taken to mean to cover over. So love covers over all things. They cite Peter's statement in his epistle that love covers over a multitude of sins. And that is certainly correct. So love does not point out each and every flaw. It doesn't shine the light on every possible problem. Love knows how to overlook certain things, how to cover over a weakness or a failing. And certainly we would say this is true. Love does have that sense of restraint and self-control. It doesn't have to pick at this and that and that and that. Love can look at the object of love and see flaws and yet not be compelled to point out everything that could be pointed out. And how much we need this in our human relations. Think about marriage. How would you feel if your spouse pointed out every single flaw or fault that you have, and they did it every time? How would your marriage do if your spouse was constantly saying, oh, there's that, you did that again. I told you yesterday you did that, and now you're doing it again. It erodes trust. It breaks down confidence. And so love does have to cover over things. And it needs to know that if you constantly expose everything, the relationship can't bear that weight. So this particular option is a true option. We, we don't doubt that. But the other position says that the meaning here is intentionally parallel to the fourth verb. It has to do with bearing with, enduring, tolerating all things. They say, the people that argue this other point, say that Paul is using here a literary device called a chiasm. So verb one and verb four of the chiasm are connected, they're parallel, and then verb two and verb three are parallel. So the connection between one and four is not a contrast, it's not different ideas, it's the same idea being repeated twice. And so they say that Paul intends us here to see significant overlap, and that is part of his point. And when we think about it, love does endure. It does bear with all sorts of provocations and disappointments. Love knows how to hang in there and not give way and give up. And certainly, without any doubt, that is what the fourth verb means, so if we take this other reading of this first verb, we're saying basically what he's saying here is also what he's saying in the fourth verb. And it is true, love endures. So which one should we choose? Which is it? Or is it some combination of the two? Being a good 
student of John Calvin, I'll do what he did. Maybe Calvin was copping out, but he would come to these exegetical difficulties in the text of Scripture, and he would say, it could mean this, it could mean that. You choose. You are responsible hearers of God's Word. You're good students of the Bible. You have brains that God has given you. You choose. And as happens so often in these cases, the end results, the conclusions, are really not all that different, no matter which one of the options you may prefer. For my sake, I'm undecided. <laughs> Because I can see it both ways. I can see good reason for option A. I can see good reason for option B. And so I am content with either one. Now the second verb of the four is a more familiar one, pistuo. Pistuo means to believe, to have faith, to trust. It is the basic word about faith in the Greek language. Love is always trusting. It is always closely connected to and allied with faith. Love believes, and love is not racked by doubt or dark suspicion. But this doesn't mean that love is gullible or naive. In their commentary, Sampa and Rosner point this out. They say, this has nothing to do with a naive credulity. This is not about always trusting those around us who are often not worthy of such trust, but about trusting the one who calls us to love others and living out that love for others as a reflection of our trust in him. So love is not so naive that it takes everything at face value and believes everything implicitly. No, love has a discernment to it. But love always trusts and believes in the one who is the object of our faith. And so we are trusting the one who calls us to love others and to live out that love in our lives. And so love and faith in Christ go together. Well, love not only believes all things, but love hopes all things. This is the third verb. It is always hoping, just as it is constantly believing. And again, Siamp and Rosner are very helpful and insightful in their comments. They say, here again, this has nothing to do with a naive optimism. This is not about hoping for the best in those around us. It is about maintaining the hope set before us by the one to whom we have entrusted our lives and our futures, and being empowered by that eschatological hope for our future to take the risk of loving those around us in the present. So again, it's not looking around and say, I hope you all are nice people. I hope you all behave yourselves. I hope you always do the right thing. I am going to extend to you this kind of uh, naive, gullible hope. And we're going to hope for the best. It's not a horizontal hope. It's a hope that is fixed on God. It's a hope in him who calls us to love our neighbors. Hoping in God, I can now show love to those around me. I can even love my enemies and those who persecute me because my hope is in God. So just as faith is vertically oriented toward God, hope is also oriented towards God. It is certainly a childish position to have this kind of horizontal confidence in our fellow man. Because man is fallen, man is sinful, man will disappoint us, but God never does. Richard Pratt also has a helpful 
comment here. He says, this hope is not based on the Christian, but on Christ. The hope of each Christian is that Christ will preserve him to glory. When a brother falls, it is Christ who picks him up and makes him stand. Christ is the one who promised to finish the work he began. Again, Dr. Pratt is saying this is vertical. This is hope and trust in God. It is oriented towards Christ, not toward our fellow Christian, not towards other human beings. So love believes, love hopes, and then finally, the fourth verb, love endures. Love always perseveres in all cases, in every situation. And again, forgive me for leaning on Siemp and Rosner. They're, they're very helpful here. Love never gives up. It never quits. It never dies or comes to extinction. It perseveres or endures through all of the challenges of this life and finds itself alive and well in all the ages to come. So just as love will not give in, neither will it give up. Love continues through thick and thin, through hard times and good times, in seasons of plenty, in seasons of want. It is the steady, persevering, unflappable presence. It is bulldog tenacity. And if you want proof of this abiding, enduring, bulldog love, look at how God deals with us. Just in this past week, he could have surely given up on each and every one of us. He could have put us at the curb. He could have said, I'm tired of you. You failed again. You've not lived up to your high calling. You've not behaved yourself. You've not spoken or thought the way you should have. But God never does that. God perseveres and endures with us. And his love will not let us go. This is the love that could hear Peter say, I don't even know the man. And yet come back to him and say, Peter, feed my sheep. The love of God endures. And so our love also is to endure. Now taken one by one, these four facets of love are indeed impressive. As we think about always bearing up, always believing, hoping in all situations, enduring all things, each one of them challenges us. But there's also a sense in which the portrait of love given in this verse should be viewed as a collective whole. So we appreciate the parts, but we also see the thrust of the whole. The Lutheran scholar Lenski summarizes it well. In these four statements, the inner power of love is revealed. Her head is held high, her eye is bright and shining, her hand is steady and true, her heart strong with strength from above. This love has rightly been called the greatest thing in the world. Now, if we take the view that I described a bit earlier, that this first verb is a synonym of the fourth verb, and if we buy the idea that this verse is really a small literary chiasm, then something else emerges that gives us something of the bigger picture. So for the sake of my point, let's assume that both verbs 1 and 4 are speaking about endurance, about perseverance, bearing up and holding on. Love doesn't give in, and it won't give up. 
And if you think about it, both of those two concepts have to do with the present moment. They are focused on present experiences. Love may be heavy laden. Love could be sorely vexed. Love can be tried, but love won't collapse under the weight of the present trials. It won't throw in the towel in the face of adversity. So love has a bulldog tenacity in the current moment, in the present hour. The second part of the chiasm are verbs two and three. And these two are quite obviously connected to each other, believing all things and hoping all things. And this is the triad that Paul is going to highlight at the end of the chapter, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So love believes, love has faith, love always hopes, love is full of hope. And these two things, faith and hope, are outwardly oriented. They are extrospective. They are also future-oriented. For who hopes for what he already has? So we believe and we hope with an eye to the future. So here is the powerful confluence of these ideas. In the present hour, love is hanging on. It endures like a bulldog. It will not let go. And yet love always has its eyes focused on the future. It looks beyond this life and this world. It looks to God. It is believing in him and hoping in him and his promises. And with such a future orientation, it is strengthened even more in the present to hang tough in the midst of this hour, come what may. So here is the bulldog tenacity of love. It is a present power with a future expectation that cannot be disappointed. We live in the present, but we will also live in the future. And if we live in love, we are equipped for both. We are equipped to live today, presently. We'll hang in there. We'll endure no matter what. And even if it gets harder and harder, our resolve gets stronger and stronger. We are tenacious and hanging on because love compels us to grab hold of God and his promises and not let go. But we also have a tenacity regarding eternity, regarding the life to come. We realize that this place in which we live is a temporary abode and that we are pilgrims and aliens in this place. We are passing through and on our way to the celestial city. We are seeking a better country, a land where righteousness dwells. We want to be with the Lord, and we believe in him, and we hope in him. And we are not going to be distracted. We are not going to be diverted from pursuing that road that will lead us to life eternal. And so love is the glue that holds us in the present hour, but it is also the thing that points us to an eternity that is beyond description for its wonder and its beauty. And so this love that's being described here, this tenacious, strong-hearted confidence is useful for today and it is useful for forever. So how does one gain such love, and how does one practice such love? How can you develop a bulldog tenacity 
with this kind of love. So let me suggest to you some practical suggestions, but let me first say that I don't think you can really exhibit this kind of love if you have never experienced the love that God has for you. In John, in 1 John, we read that we love because he first loved us. A non-Christian simply cannot have this kind of confidence, this kind of tenacity, because a non-Christian doesn't believe and has no hope because they are without God. And so it's simply a prerequisite. In order to love like this, you have first had to experience this love yourself. And God's love equips us to be these things and to do these things. So if you have never humbled yourself and surrendered your soul to God, I would urge and encourage you to do so today. And in him you will find full and free forgiveness for each and every one of your sins. In him you will find the righteousness of Christ imputed to you and received by faith alone. And from him you will receive his indwelling spirit and the promise of eternal life. And as the Spirit takes up his residence in you and begins his work in you, one of the things that he produces in God's people is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, first and foremost. Not a kind of mushy, romantic, emotional feeling, but this bulldog love. This love that is always believing, always hoping, always enduring, always persevering. This love comes through the work of the Spirit. So if you have experienced his love, then there are several things you can do to develop and strengthen your own tenacity. And the first suggestion I would make would be to fix your eyes on Jesus and keep looking to him. Remember again the quote from Richard Pratt, this hope is based not on the Christian, but on Christ. The hope of each Christian is that Christ will preserve him to glory. When a brother falls, it is Christ who picks him up and makes him stand. Christ is the one who promised to finish the work he began in you. And so you have to believe him. You have to hope in Christ and his promises if you are to bear up and endure all things in the present and have any hope for the future. We simply cannot do this by focusing upon ourselves. We must constantly focus on on him, on Christ. He is our friend. He is the lover of our souls. He is our redeemer, our savior, our prophet, our priest, our king, our mediator. He is the one who intercedes for us. He is the one who calls us. And so look to Christ and see him and you will see this love not only in him, but begin developing in you. My second suggestion is really quite obvious, and that is that you should specifically pray for all four of these qualities in your life. Bow down and ask him this. Lord, would you enable me to bear all things? Would you help me to believe all things? Would you strengthen me to hope in you? And by your grace, please empower me to persevere in love. Lord, give me this tenacity. Give me the tenacity of love. 
There are certain prayers that we can pray that God will not necessarily answer because he's never promised to answer. Lord, I want to win the lottery. I'm sorry, he hasn't promised that you'll win the lottery. Lord, I want the Yankees to win the World Series this year. No promises there. Lord, give me faith and hope and love. Lord, enable me to persevere. These are good things according to his word. And as you bring this to him, and as you spread your Bible before him, even as Hezekiah spread out that wicked letter before the Lord in the temple, if you spread this book before him and say, Lord, here in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says this, and I want that. Is he going to say, no, I'm sorry? We're not going to give you that. You can go to God's word, pray these things, seek them with all your heart, and God will be pleased to give you these things according to his word. This is not a wasted prayer that's never going to be answered. These are prayers according to his will. Is it God's will that you would believe in him in all situations, that you would hope in him in all of his promises? Is it God's will that you would bear with and endure in all situations? Of course it is. Of course it is. So pray for those things. Boldly ask for them. Knock at the door and do not take no for an answer. I fear too often especially on clear biblical things like this, we are just far too timid. We come to God hat in hand and say, uh, Lord, um, well, um, oh, never mind, never mind. We are the children of God who have a right to go to our Heavenly Father in the name of Christ and by the power of the Spirit and with humility press Him for these things. I need more faith in my life. I need a stronger sense of hope in you. I need the steel, the metal to endure whatever Satan and the world and the flesh throw at me. Give me these things. We should be like Jacob at the brook who said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Was that impertinent? I don't think so. That was bold. That was holy boldness in prayer. As the pre-incarnate Christ showed by touching his sinew, Christ could have destroyed Jacob with the touch of a finger. And so in a sense, it's Jacob being very risky, kind of edgy, but bold in prayer. And God did bless him. And he'll bless us with these things if we ask and do not doubt. So pray. Thirdly, don't allow yourselves to be dragged down by the quicksand of pessimism and hopelessness. Recently read a story about a hiker in Zion National Park in southern Utah who is out hiking the uh, Zion Narrows, a very picturesque hiking spot, and you're actually hiking through a stream bed, and as he was going through, he got stuck in quicksand. One of his legs went down into the quicksand, and they couldn't get him out. And so they finally had to fly in rescuers who came and worked for hours to get him out. And then when they got him out, a winter storm hit, so they had to hunker down in the tent. What a miserable night for a person. This is what pessimism does to you. It sucks you in and it holds you there. Hopelessness and despair can be like cement at your feet. And if you find pessimism and hopelessness to be somewhat attractive to you, then you need to avoid going anywhere near it lest you fall into that pit and it suck you under. 
as this verse has suggested, love has an abiding positivity to it. No, it's not naive. It's not gullible. But boy, is it optimistic. It's an optimism rooted in a knowledge of God's nature and character. It flows from the promises that God makes in his word. So if you take seriously the promises of God's word, it's almost impossible to maintain pessimism and hopelessness. Now now just try this. When you are being tempted and drawn to be despairing and despondent, when all outside seems dark and gloomy, when everything seems to be trending bad in your life. Go to the promises of God. Read and meditate on the promises of his word. Go to this promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a wonderful word that is. And go to that promise and meditate and reflect on it and it will rescue you from the pessimism that your heart is perhaps prone to. And finally, surround yourself with those who exhibit this kind of bulldog tenacity, this kind of love that won't give up or give in. Surround yourself with strong Christians, with strong faith and strong hope. I go back to the comedy sketch on the BBC. The somewhat optimistic comedian was trying to combat the hopelessness of his partner. And as they went back and forth, the pessimistic friend began planting seeds of doubt and despair in the more optimistic fellow's mind. And very quickly, hopelessness extinguished optimism. Do not surround yourself with people who are constantly complaining, who are hopeless, who are full of despair, and who can only see how horrible things are all the time. And I would say this not only for your physical enfleshed friends that you maybe have coffee with or have living next door, you know, the people in our lives. I would also caution you against companions you might hear through media. I used to listen to a lot of talk radio, a lot. And what I found was that there was a constant stream of complaining about how horrible the country is, how rotten Congress is, how this leader or that leader has such horrible things going on in their life or such horrible ideas. And as I was filling my ears with that kind of talk, I found it very hard to resist the pull towards this kind of cynical pessimism. And even though they were funny and entertaining, they were like a cancer eating away at my hope in God. And those voices never pointed me to Christ. They never reminded me of God's word. They never spoke the promises of God in my ears But all they could do was harp on how horrible this or that person was. The companion of fools comes to ruin. But those who walk with the wise will be wise. Find people, whether physical people or these virtual friends. Surround yourself with people who are Christians who believe and hope and trust in God and who know how to love. 
and their good example will rub off on you. There's one other thing you should do, and that's right here. This table. 